Good evening. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. The strikes on Damascus. Why? What does it mean for the region, for not just the Golan Heights, the border, the very hot border between Israel and Syria, but also for Lebanon and for Jordan and for Iraq and for Turkey? That tonight is the subject of much of our conversation because what started on the weekends with the IAF striking deep bunkers, arsenals filled with very sophisticated long-range missiles provided by Iran, that is part of a much larger story, a vast story playing out over these last years. The darkness visible of the civil war in Syria is also part of that story. But the dance here is between the devil, that's Tehran, and those who are opposing the devil in the region, certainly Jerusalem, but also there are friends across Europe who see the threat of the devils in Tehran. Berlin sees it, Paris sees it, London sees it, Moscow sees it, though Moscow believes that there is another outcome besides the fall of Tehran and the fall of Damascus. Moscow has its own reasons to doubt that clearing out Tehran and Damascus of the devils will lead to peace. Does Washington see it? That's an open question. I don't have a complete yes. That's part of the inquiry. And we begin immediately with Tom Jocelyn of the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy. He keeps the Long War Journal. Tom is here because there is a golden oldie of Jocelyn writing on the FTD Long War Journal. And that goes back to November 7th, 2012. Tom, a very good evening to you. In November 7th, 2012, you filed on FTD, on Long War Journal, about what we knew at the time of the Benghazi attacks, September 11th, 2012. The anniversary, the date of the 9-11 attack on Washington. And on that day, there were demonstrations, provocations in Cairo, in Sana'a, the capital of Yemen, also in Tunis of Tunisia. And then, oh, late in the day, there was an attack in Benghazi. Unusual because the American embassy was in Tripoli. The other states seen action that day in the capitals of the Arabs uh, of the Arabs countries. But Benghazi, a secondary city of Libya, liberated from the Gaddafi regime. And that attack that night is the center of the inquiry now going forward in Washington. What did we know on November 7th of the attack? What did we know from al-Qaeda of the nature of that attack? Good evening, Tom. Good evening, John. Uh, you know, one of the aspects I've been focused on from the beginning of the story is that looking back to the um, assault on the U.S. Embassy in Cairo where the American flag was taken down and this black al-Qaeda-style flag was raised, later in the day the attack in Benghazi, and then it was on the 13th the embassy in Sana'a is assaulted, and then on the 14th the embassy in Tunis is assaulted. There are, uh, you know, basically two ways to look at all this. Um, in each case, the black flag of al-Qaeda has risen over the American flag. The American flag is torn down, the embassy is assaulted, and the black flag of al-Qaeda is, is raised. And, of course, in Benghazi we have an actual terrorist attack. Um, there are two ways to look at this. One, it's either a spontaneous outpouring of rage at this uh, video trailer that uh, few had ever seen before September 11th of last year, or... Uh, it was actually orchestrated by al-Qaeda-linked parties to try to demonstrate that al-Qaeda's ideology lived. And I think it's the latter. I think when you look at all the specific individuals who were involved in instigating these assaults on U.S. embassies and the attack in Benghazi, what you find in each case are specific al-Qaeda-linked personalities, guys who we know who were designated by the U.S. government and the U.N. as al-Qaeda-affiliated terrorists. Um, he started early in the day on September 11th of last year in Cairo, where Muhammad al-Zawahiri, this is the brother of Ayman al-Zawahiri, the emir of al-Qaeda, this is his brother, brother, I mean, closely allied with his brother since the 1970s or even earlier when they first formed their first terrorist cell together as young boys. Muhammad al-Zawahiri indisputably helped lead the uh, riot, basically, in Cairo against the U.S. Embassy there. And several other high-level al-Qaeda-linked personalities were there out front of the U.S. Embassy in Cairo, you know, urging on demonstrators and orchestrating that protest, which led to the American flag coming down and the black flag going up. Well, when you look at all these events from al-Qaeda's perspective, and this is something that al-Qaeda's Amir Ayman al-Zawahiri has talked about, and this is something that al-Qaeda and the, Al the Raven Peninsula has talked about in their Inspire magazine, which is their English magazine. They basically look at all this and they say, see, see, 
Al Qaeda's ideology lives because look what happened to their embassies. Look what happened in Benghazi. What you see are these Muslims who are just spontaneously, uh, you know, basically lashing out the U.S. and American uh, authorities uh, over this this uh, film, and they're endorsing Al Qaeda in the process, and they're raising Al Qaeda's black flag and the black flag of Islam and, and the black flag of monotheism in its place. Um, what I say is no, that's not right. Actually, that's their narrative. That's their propaganda. That's their their game in all this. They're trying to show that they're still alive in the Muslim world and that the Muslim world is endorsing Al Qaeda. And I think it's a mistake for U.S. officials not to point out the Al Qaeda links to these groups because you're basically falling into their propaganda trap. You're allowing them to you're allowing them to portray all these instances as something other than what they really are. We'll continue about Benghazi, but uh, we veer immediately to the battlefront in Afghanistan because there were a lot of casualties over the week on not only green on blue attacks, but also a roadside, a, an IED attack. Uh, Bill Roggio, the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, joins. Bill, the blue on green attack, it looks pretty straightforward. Afghan soldier kills two NATO troops in an attack in western Afghanistan. You write that this is the sixth green on blue or insider attack, Afghan security personnel opening fire on western forces. They have not found a solution for this. Is this correct, Bill? Even disarming the Afghan soldiers in the vicinity of the ISAF soldiers has not solved it. Yeah, um, the, last year there were, we recorded 42 attacks. Um, these are, typically the attacks that we find out about are the ones where someone is killed. Actually, those are the ones we always find out about. Occasionally when someone's wounded or, or if, if a press report comes out. But there's a whole slew of attacks that ISAF has said are classified. These are ones where no one's hurt. Um, actually, we had a reporter in the field who uh, was at the scene of one of these uh, unreported green on blue attacks, um, the tal- where Afghan policemen opened fire on American troops in, in Kandahar province. So we have these attacks still occurring. There's a fewer attacks this year. However, we have to remember that the reason the reduction, I think, is occurring is not because of any measures that have been put in place. It's because there's just far less interaction with Afghan security forces. Right, we've backed off. Bill, let's go to the roadside bombs, southern Afghanistan. Five members of the U.S. Army killed on Saturday. The IEDs, I know I've dealt with them over the years in Afghanistan. They're not as commonplace as they are in Iraq because, of course, the population is much more spread out and our troops are in the open road and not necessarily crowded in in Baghdad. But this looks like a significant strike. Is there any change in uh, the M.O. of the Taliban for this, or did they just get what you'd have to say very bad one day they hit us hard? Yeah, I think this is a case where they just got lucky um, and, and hit us hard on this, this particular attack. I haven't seen any data come out. Um, we saw in Iraq that, that, that sometimes they are able to increase either the ability to hide that IED or they come up with a formula that really can knock it out. But ultimately, they have to be able to deploy them. And you put enough vehicles on the road and you're driving around enough, you can't det- find and detect and dismantle every one. Um, they're going to get some through, and this was just a case of, of that happening. At least that's the way. Uh, that's what I could see from, my, my, from here. Back to uh, Benghazi. You both have been reporting on this. We know that there are going to be revelations. They're coming right now from the so-called whistleblowers at the State Department. But, Tom, I want to go back to November and December of last year after Zawahiri took credit for this and al-Qaeda was able to recruit on it. After that, we had the deterioration in Mali. We had the incident in Tunisia. We had incidents in Morocco all across the Maghreb. At this point, your opinion, did Benghazi prove a turning point in the region for al-Qaeda? Has it been growing in audacity since the Benghazi attack? You know, it's tough to say. I think it was growing anyway. I think uh, when, when you look at this, I mean, Zawahiri and al-Qaeda have been very clever about this. They, they haven't actually come right out and said, taking credit for it. What they've done is they've said, this proves that al-Qaeda's ideology lives because all these Muslims are spontaneously uh, raising the black flag, um, which I think is wrong. I think al-Qaeda lives because al-Qaeda is an organization that's rebuilding itself throughout all the Arab Spring countries. And it, Really, when you look at Benghazi and you look at these other countries, what you see is sort of the next iteration of Al Qaeda and how it's evolved in the post Arab Spring world. And you look at Mali, for instance, it's a direct function of what happened in Libya, where all the arms spilled out of Gaddafi's right. offers into Mali and elsewhere. But look at Benghazi specifically and how that came together. Look at the specific reports we have now of who was responsible for the attack. You have 
Egyptian terrorists trained by a guy who was communicating with Ayman al Zawahiri. This is Muhammad Jamal Al Kashif's gang. He had these he had these camps in eastern Libya, and he trained some of the Benghazi attackers. You have reports that Al Qaeda and Iraq affiliated terrorists were involved. You have now the CNN just reported over the weekend that three or four Al Qaeda and Arabian Peninsula terrorists were involved, and then you have this supposedly local group called Ansar al Sharia, which actually shares the name of other Al Qaeda affiliated groups, and they they were involved. So you look at it, and what you see is this basically consortium of al-Qaeda-linked terrorists are involved in doing this hit. Um, and you also have ties to al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb. That's five different al-Qaeda-linked parties that are responsible for Benghazi, and yet, for some reason, the Obama administration the U.S. government can't come around and say, this is basically the new al-Qaeda that attacked us. Tom Jocelyn of the Foundation for the Defense of Democ- Democracies with his colleague, Bill Rajo, the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. When we come back, more of the war fighting, the so-called spring offensive in Afghanistan. The Pakistani Taliban are very active as well, st- uh, still a threat to Pakistan and the region. And then one more time about the war fighting in the region after Benghazi. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. <laughs> 